If you're developing, planning, or investing in a major project, if you're even just thinking about a big idea, stop and listen to this program. Whether you build skyscrapers or public works projects, or you've got designs on transformational change in any sector of commercial real estate, this conversation may transform your perspective and your approach. On this episode, a professor offers a lesson on how big things get done. Compared to other sectors of the economy, innovation and technological development has been way too slow in, in the real estate industry. And that's something that I think the industry needs to look at in order to thrive in the future. That's Bent Flubier, a professor at Oxford University and also at the IT University in Copenhagen. His specialty is economic geography, specifically the economics of cities and regions, which is how he came to write the latest of his 10 books an in-depth study of mega projects and more. And the title says it all. It's called How Big Things Get Done. The surprising factors that determine the fate of every project, from home renovations to space exploration and everything in between. Coming up, we turn the pages of Professor Flubier's book to learn from his take on history. From select case studies that show what works and what doesn't. We also find out what commercial real estate can learn from animated movies, an idea he calls Pixar planning, how big things get done. I'm Spencer Levy, and that's right now on The Weekly Take. Welcome to The Weekly Take. Professor, thank you for joining the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Let's just start with the very big picture. Uh, We're talking to the real estate industry on this call. So the question how do you get big things done? You get them done by really knowing what you're doing. And for the real estate industry, I think it's time to think about how do we change things in, in real estate and especially in the way real estate is being constructed and the way it's being used. Because compared to other sectors of the economy, innovation and technological development has been way too slow in, in the real estate industry. And that's something that I think the industry needs to look at in order to thrive in the future. And I also think they need to look at it if they don't want to risk getting disrupted from the outside, which is not a pleasant experience. We'll talk later about that in our conversation about creative destruction in the construction process. But let's talk now um, just a little bit more narrowly about the book itself, about the various categories that people should be thinking about. You have uh, several chapters in this book, uh, starting with thinking slow, acting fast, the commitment fallacy, thinking right to left, Without listing all the chapters of the book, what are some of the biggest ideas that you'd like people to take away from your book, particularly in real estate? I really think this idea of thinking slow, acting fast is crucial, especially because most projects are done the exact opposite way. People think fast and then they are forced to act slow because there are so many things they didn't think through that are going to come back and bite them during delivery. That's what you typically see. So We actually say that think slow, act fast is the rhythm of a successful project. And uh, think slow doesn't necessarily mean that you have to take years uh, for it, even though some people do that. But it means you you have to take sufficient time that you actually really know what it is that you're doing once you start on the expensive part of the project, which is the project delivery. I love the way you frame it because I think so much of getting big things done isn't the physical engineering of a project, but the psychology of teamwork. Is that a fair way to put it? That's a very fair way to put it. And it's actually a problem that if you look at it historically, uh, doing big projects has grown out of engineering. And engineers don't think a lot about psychology and behavior. They think about things and they're interested in things and not so much in people. That's why they decided to study engineering is because they're interested in things and that's great. We really need great engineers uh, and they're very good at design and getting stuff designed and built. But there's one thing that is not part of their education and that is understanding human behavior. So that's a new thing we want to bring to the field in this book is we want, we want to tell the field of project leadership and project management, you've got to look at the behavioral side. If you don't look at the behavioral side, you're never going to be able to do projects successfully. Is getting big things done a process of getting the team all to be psychologically together or a heavy hand from the top that makes people do it? Do you have a point of view on that, Ben? Well, you can do both. I mean, uh, and it's very easy. Both exist in the real world, so you can study them in action. And I think 
Robert Moses is probably the mega project builder who has built the most uh, mega projects for one individual in the world. There might be some in China that is now matching it. I'm not sure about that. But certainly outside of China, nobody has built more mega projects than Robert Moses. He did it in a very autocratic way. He was the autocrat at the top of this uh, planning system, actually several planning systems in New York City and the New York region. He would just bulldoze through neighborhoods and he got got away with it for decades. Uh, Only towards the end of his career, he he actually wanted to bulldoze through Greenwich Village in Manhattan and put a road right through there. But a famous urban planner, uh, urban thinker uh, happened to live there, Jane Jacobs, another very famous American. And she decided to organize against uh, Moses and his projects. And she succeeded in and. uh, It turned out this was in the 60s. By that time, his way of doing things was just over historically. And you can't do it that way anymore unless you live in China or another autocracy. And you have a little chapter in this book about, the the, I think you call it the Chinese experiment, about how a different form of government is able to get big things done, while sometimes nimbyism, which you also mentioned in this book about being an impediment to projects, maybe too much democracy is an impediment. Is there some middle ground? How do you get it done under either form of government? So you can get it done on, under either form of government, and it's happening. Obviously, I'm a subscriber to democracy, living in a democracy, and wouldn't want that we would get the, the ways of autocracy of doing uh, big projects. But in a democratic kind of society, it really boils down to good stakeholder management. You need to take everybody into account, because in today's society, you cannot bulldoze over neighborhoods and, and, and community groups and so on the way Moses did. So you need to take them into account. And we have very good examples of this. You know, there are good ways of doing it and there are bad ways of doing it. And you can't always please everybody. And, and that's what you need to explain to people. There might be people here who will not be happy with the project. But uh, here's what we can do for you anyway. And here's what we're going to do for whatever the affected stakeholder groups are. And here's how we can help you. Here's how you can help us and so on. That's the kind of dialogue you need to have. And you need to, uh, to uh, take the initiative from the very beginning, not wait. We have a heuristic in the book uh, that that we call make friends and keep them friendly. This is actually the secret to make it work in a democracy. You, you need to build bridges, social bridges to stakeholder group, groups, and uh, you need to do it early on. As we also say, it's too late to build your, build your bridges when you need them. They need to be built beforehand. So you need to think proactively about this when you're planning a project. You need to think, what, who are the important stakeholder groups? How do we involve them? You need to actually have people hired in project staff whose job it is to manage the stakeholder relationships. It's really important. So let's do a little compare and contrast here of, of projects that worked and projects that didn't. And let's just talk about why. One of the great projects that I often point to is the Empire State Building, which is a, a chapter in your book talking about how that got done in record time, under budget, uh, quite a remarkable feat. And then you have on the other end of the spectrum, and this is not me knocking it, it's just in the book, talking about the uh, California high-speed rail. Why did the Empire State Building work and why is high-speed rail uh, sort of on the sidelines? The Empire State uh, Building worked because it was incredibly well organized by people who knew what they were doing. And they had actually already built a skyscraper uh, similar to it. Not a lot of people know this, but there's actually a shorter version of the Empire State Building built somewhere else for the Reynolds uh, Tobacco Company. So the same architects had designed that and used the experience from that to design the Empire State Building. And one thing that uh, his practice had learned was that you really need to be prepared in detail. So for the Empire State Building, the last knot and bolt to put the building together was uh, predefined and designed and had been produced before they started uh, construction. So that's one thing. The other thing was that they decided to use what we call a modular format. So they actually put it in a very catchy way. They said, We didn't build a 100-plus story building. We built the same story a 100-plus times, and then we just put them on top of each other. So they actually built the same story over and over again, with slight variation. As you go up, you can see the building changes a bit. But it's a very basic truth that they actually built the same story over and over. And this means that you get something that we in the book call positive learning curves. It means that every time you do something, You can do it a bit bit better the next time because you learn from it and you can do it a bit cheaper. So you become more and more effective. And that's why it's such a a great trick, actually, 
to build big projects like that. You build big projects by building a lot of small projects. So in this case, 100 plus stories turns into a 100 plus skyscraper by building the same story over and over. And the speed of building those stories went up as they went along. So they were building faster and faster and better and better quality, cheaper and cheaper. That's why this is actually an incredible feat. They delivered 17% under budget. That almost never happens. And they built on time. So on time and on budget, as we show in the book, only 8.5% of projects achieve that. So only 8.5% achieve on time and on budget. And the Empire State Building is one of those projects, very successful projects. And then you compare that on the other end. And again, this is not to knock it, it's just a fact. The California High Speed Rail Project, which... Uh, uh, doesn't seem to be getting uh, a whole lot of traction. What is the fundamental flaw in that project? They've done the exact opposite of what they did with the Empire State Building, that they haven't planned it properly up front. So they really thought slow on the Empire State Building, not meaning that they took years to think about it. They just took the time that was needed in order to think through the skyscraper. On the California High Speed Rail project, they haven't done that. And now it turns out that they're winding the project down as they go along, not even building half of it. Uh, money-wise, uh, they're going to end up uh, building only the stretch in the Central Valley from Merced to uh, Bakersfield. And I don't think anybody, if you had come up with that as the original idea, saying we're going to build a high-speed rail line in California between Bakersfield and Merced, I mean, I don't think anybody would have approved that. I don't think the California voters uh, who approved this project would have approved it if it had been described the way that it now is actually going to turn out and it's going to be postponed into some distant future. Whether this uh, part that they built is ever going to get connected to Los Angeles and San Francisco, which was the whole point, you know, was to connect LA and San Francisco. As we write in the book, we think that this is going to go down in history as really one of the examples of how not to do a big project. Being a little bit more narrow for the real estate industry, what's the role of things like a public-private partnership? So um, public-private partnerships are fine as long as they're done right. And that's really the crucial matter here. So there are lots of public-private partnerships. Some are done well, some are not done well. And uh, that's really what matters, how they're done. So it's a good idea if you have a good setup, if you write a good contract that is regulating the relationship between the public party and the private party, that's crucial. Often the contracts are not good and, and that creates problems. Uh, but if you get all those things right, uh, then public-private partnerships are fine. But of course, that's not the whole story. There's also the, the story about all the other stakeholders, like people, who, anybody who's affected in a major way by the project uh, that you are, are doing. Uh, needs uh, to be considered in, in one way or the other. So that's what we call stakeholder management or stakeholder collaboration. And that's also something to pay attention to that in the book we call it make friends and keep them friendly. That's sort of the social aspect and sometimes political aspect of delivering projects. And it's really important. But that's actually a thing that I think that the real estate sector gets pretty well and probably better than a lot of other sectors that the real estate sector has a way of thinking about projects as social and political and not only technical. It's not just about construction and engineering, obviously. Tactically speaking, say you're starting a new project, uh, what are the considerations to do up front, uh, considering the fact that planning takes time? Um, what are some of the effective ways to implement or manage what you would call Pixar planning? So the two things that you need to have in place up front is uh, that you have a, to have a realistic business case. So you need to know what it is that you're doing and, and you need to know whether you actually have the money. Uh, so that means you have to have a realistic budget and you wouldn't believe how often that is violated. Uh, so that's one thing, realistic business case. Then the second thing is an effective delivery team. Those are the two legs that you need to stand on. Once you have these things, then the, the question becomes developing your plan. And this is the thinking slow phase. And this is what Pixar is so good at. They typically spend two years before they even start uh, shooting a film, two years in development where they experiment and they do trial and error. They iterate the film and they spend those two years doing more and more sophisticated versions of the film. They simulate the film before they, they, they do it in order to be sure that they know what they're doing when they start using the expensive equipment, when they start hiring in the expensive actors to do voiceovers, when they start hiring in the expensive uh, composers to do the score, etc. 
so that they are sure that they don't waste money during that phase. And that's one reason that Pixar is so successful. They really have that process down by doing it over and over and over again, not just within the single film, but also be between films, uh, Pixar is, is using this approach of iterating, 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 and getting better and better at what they're doing. And it's a huge success, as we all know. No other Hollywood studio has done 20 plus blockbusters in a row. One of the things you mentioned in your book is stories, not stats. And what it means, and I think you describe it far better than I do, is if you really want to persuade somebody, you're not going to persuade him, with him or her with a spreadsheet. You're going to persuade them with the concept so that they feel it in addition to thinking it. What's your point of view, Ben? So in the book, we decided uh, that we would never lose sight of a specific example and a specific story. That's why you have, I, I counted them actually after the book came out. Not I didn't before, but after it came out, I counted that we have 99 different examples of the things that we are talking about here in the book, each with a little story or sometimes a long story, a full chapter, and sometimes popping up again in later chapters. So I think that in a sense answers your question. We really think storytelling is important. And if you want to persuade a reader that something is worth doing or is interesting to know about, you need to have good stories about it. We don't stop there, however, because we want a scholarly base for what we are saying. You know, I am a professor at Oxford and the IT University in Copenhagen. So part of my job is to make sure that what we are saying holds up to scholarly standards. And for that, we need data. So in addition to the stories, we also have actually the world's uh, largest database on project performance. 16,000 plus projects are the basis for this book, where we can test all sorts of ideas on the data, uh, including this thing that I call the iron law of project management, which is, in short, it's, it's over budget, over time, under benefits, over and over again. And like I said before, 8.5% of projects are on time and on budget. But if you uh, require that, projects must be on time, on budget, and deliver the promised benefits, then it's only one half of a percent, 0.5%. Can you believe it? I mean, it's a stunning number. And this gives our arguments power, you know, that we can actually document things uh, quantitatively, statistically, with the kind of data that we have. So it's not only the stories, it's stories plus data is uh, persuasion in my book. I'm turning now to... Page 173 of your book, and I'm looking at your chart. You don't have to open up your book because I, you wrote it, uh, but you list the different projects that have the greatest chance of success and then those that are underperforming. So at the top of the list of those that are uh, thin tail risk, to use your terminology, you have solar, wind power, uh, road work, and then you have as the bottom, the fat tail risk, to use your terminology, nuclear power, Olympics, and nuclear storage. So those are two ends of the spectrum. Why don't you tell our audience about those two ends of the spectrum of the types of projects? And by the way, building is somewhere in the middle, which is our business. But tell us about the both ends of the spectrum, why they are different. Yeah, and this has never been done before. It's actually the first time that this pattern is shown anywhere is in this book. We can see 25 different project types and we can see which project types perform well and which project types perform poorly. And not only somewhat poorly, like poorly at the level of really blowing up in your face in an extreme manner. Like you said, solar farms, actually, and wind farms uh, and uh, pipelines and electricity transmission and so on, they are at the good end of the scale. They're quite predictable. And you don't uh, have big surprises, big budget blowouts and big delays and so on at that end of the scale. And we explain this by these are modular projects. These are actually projects that you build uh, uh, by building big from small units. So think about a solar panel. It's built modular. It's built on the basis of solar cells, right? The solar cells is what we call a Lego. You know, I'm Danish and uh, I love the toy Lego, which is a Danish toy uh, that we all grew up with as kids, you know. And uh, the Lego is a good metaphor here. It's a basic building block. If you look at a wind farm, the basic uh, Lego, the basic building block is the solar cell. Then you put a lot of solar cells on a panel, then you have a solar panel. Then you put a lot of panels in an array. Then you put a lot of arrays together and you can build a solar farm however big you want it. Huge solar farm. And that is actually happening all over the world today. This is one of the ways we are doing the energy transition. It's very efficient. That's very lucky for us. And it's very efficient and it's going well. It's getting cheaper and cheaper and faster and faster because it's modular. Same for wind farms. Same for anything, actually, you can build in this way. It doesn't have to be uh, energy. It can be anything. 
At the other end of the scale, you have the products that are blowing up in your face, and they are typically products that are bespoke. So they are unique. There's only one of this. Like when you build a nuclear power plant, even though the nuclear industry has really tried to standardize uh, nuclear power plants, they have not succeeded. It's still all sorts of bespoke work that has to be done on site, not in factories. So you actually have a construction site. It takes forever. It's not uncommon to take 10, 15 years to build a nuclear power plant or to give them up. Uh, as has happened recently in the United States, only four uh, nuclear reactors have been under construction in the U.S. over the past few years. Two of them have been uh, given up upon and the last two are being completed at huge cost overruns and huge delays. Same in Europe. That's the problem with nuclear. Same with the Olympics. It's one of the worst project types you can find. We describe it in the book. Huge cost overruns. Obviously, no delays because you have to open on the opening date and so on. Nuclear waste storage, even worse. IT projects, really bad. They have really fat tails, meaning that they really blow up in your face in an extreme manner uh, on the cost uh, and schedule side. And again, it's because these projects tend to be done in a non-standard, bespoke manner, and they tend to take a long time. That's what you want to avoid. So if you want to be successful, it's actually quite simple if you think about it. If you want to be successful, you've got to be modular and fast. If you want to set yourself up for failure, you do something that is bespoke and slow. That's the answer. And the way to get around this is you need to start your project with, with asking, what's our Lego? So what's our basic building block? If you don't have a basic building block, it means you have a problem because it means you are on your way into a bespoke project and that's not going to go well. Well, Ben, I would say that the area within our business, which you're, I'm sure you're well aware of, Ben, that we're having challenges at the moment is in the office building sector. And I think part of that challenge, not all of it, certainly, because there's other major issues involved, may have to do with the unique nature of each office building. And they are unique in their location and in their design. By contrast, you go to the other end of the spectrum and you look at the typical industrial project. While automation is on the rise and the interior has clearly evolved over time, the exterior looks very similar to what it looked like 50 years ago. And they're all in similar outlying locations and cities. Does that explain some of the, the challenges we're having in the office sector today, in your opinion? Yeah, it does, but I do not agree that it has to be like that. So you, you're you describing it as if this is the nature of office buildings, that each office building is different. They're unique. You, you use the word unique. I actually usually say when I hear, if I on a project team hear somebody say our project is unique, I'm recommending the people in charge fire that person or send them to Oxford for retraining. That those are the two options because we have documented that people who think their projects are unique underperform. So their projects don't perform well. And that's easy to understand because if you think your project is unique, you don't have anything to learn from other projects, right? If you're unique, you are different from other projects, so you don't have anything to learn. Now, that's a recipe for disaster. So the problem is that people think about their projects as unique and there's nothing about office buildings that dictate that they have to be uh, unique, not at all. What are the most important takeaways for the building industry with your ideas? You need to go modular. But there's the problem that a lot of people, when they hear modular, they associate it with low quality. Because historically, modular buildings were built low quality, and that's a problem. So we have that reputation to struggle with. To counter that, let me mention that uh, Apple's headquarters was built as modules. They even talked about them as Legos, completely independently of what we do. Uh, Tim Cook was giving interviews talking about the parts that make up the Apple headquarters, a $5.5 billion building uh, designed by the best architects. And you know that nothing would get past Steve Jobs and uh, Johnny Ive and Norman Foster, who was the British architect on it. So those are the three people who designed the building. They have incredibly high standards, and so very high quality, but still modular. And that's the way we need to go. We need to build high quality, both the build quality, but also aesthetically. And it can be done and be modular at the same time. So that's one point. And we spell it out in the book, you know, how you do that. We give examples. We work with Frank Gehry, the famous Canadian-American architect who works out of Los Angeles. And we picked his brain of how he does this. And he's even beyond modularity because... Once you get your computers to work, uh, that you can make computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing, you have total freedom in your design and you don't need to use the traditional building methods anymore. That's the road forwards. 
Musk is another example. When he had to build the first Gigafactory, Gigafactory 1, it was called at the time, now it's called Giga Nevada, the first big factory for building batteries uh, for the electric vehicles that uh, Tesla would be building. He asked the conventional building industry how much it would cost and how long it would take them. He was told five plus billion and it would take five years. And at that time, Musk was not the rich guy that he is today. He was actually really cash poor and he needed cash in order to uh, scale Tesla at the speed that he needed to in order to have the impact on the world that he wanted. So he said, go away. I can't wait five years to get to my cash flow. I need to get to my cash flow within a year I'm going to do to construction what I've already done to rockets, what I've already done to uh, cars. I'm going to reinvent the process of how we built. And he did it. He actually built 21 small factories that would fit together like Legos into the big factory, which was a factory with the biggest footprint uh, in the whole world of any building at the time. So this is seriously big stuff that we are talking about here, but the idea exactly right uh, in building the big stuff from smaller modules. And this is what the building industry needs to do in order to be successful. They need to get rid of this idea that every building is bespoke and you just design a brand new building from scratch every time you do a building. That's a bad habit. And we need to get rid of it. One of my prime thoughts is here that we actually need to get completely rid of the construction side as a concept. We should have assembly sites where we build the Legos or the parts of the building in in factories, and then we bring them on site and assemble them. It's already being used in lots of sectors. We, We need to bring it into the construction sector without compromising on quality and aesthetics. So I think the primary impediment to modular construction, in addition to the aesthetic considerations, is that people are concerned it would take away construction jobs at the site level. And that's why you have local objection to modular. Any thoughts on how you overcome that? Yeah, but wait a minute. I mean, uh, if you have that attitude, all that's going to happen is that you're going to be disrupted from the outside. That's the way people who were doing printing in the old days would would think, you know, like we can't have this new printing technology because if we get it, our jobs are, are going to disappear. So let's prevent this. And how did that go? Not very well. So my advice to the construction industry is that you got to get in there and you got to disrupt yourself. So you need to develop these new technologies. And of course, uh, you need to make sure there are jobs uh, for people. But if you look at it, that hasn't been a big problem uh, so far in in all this new technology that is being developed. It's actually not that we are losing jobs. The types of jobs are changing for sure. An auto worker in 20 years from now is going to be a completely different creature from an auto worker 20 years before now, right? So that's 40 years and you'll have the whole transformation from the internal combustion engine to electric vehicles. And and that redefines the job. It doesn't mean that you don't need people to build the electric vehicles. It's just going to be people with different skills. So... What the construction industry needs to do is to reinvent itself, think about how they're doing things, and they need to make sure that they also have retraining for people who need new skill sets. That's what every other industry is doing. I'm going to pull the lens out for a moment, right back to your title of the book, and I'm going to take it from a different angle. And the angle I'm going to take it from is beauty, is aesthetics. How do we merge the two ideas of beauty, aesthetics, and getting things done? Yeah, and I think this is uh, incredibly important and beauty is incredibly important. I don't want, I wouldn't want to do any of this if it meant that the element of beauty in our lives would be diminished. And that's why we chose the example of the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao as a story in the book. Uh, This is an exquisite building, definitely at the level aesthetically uh, of the Sydney Opera House. Actually, those two buildings are often considered together as the two most prominent buildings of the last hundred years. And one of them was a complete disaster regarding project delivery. That's the Sydney Opera House. And it's an opera house that you can't even perform opera in because the acoustics are so bad that they don't make for opera. Whereas the Guggenheim Museum Bilbao, designed by Frank Gehry, um, was a success in every way. It was built on time. It was built actually a little bit below budget, not as much as the Empire State Building, but still three million under budget dollars. And uh, it is delivering like three to five times as many benefits as the owners had hoped in their wildest dreams. So benefits are like visitors to the museum, 
people who come to Bilbao and stay in hotels and go to restaurants and so on and do shopping and for the whole Basque region in, in the north of Spain. So a huge success. And nobody would say that's not a beautiful project. If you haven't gone there, go there. It's awe-inspiring. And the same for the Sydney Opera House. These are actually two buildings you have to see. And we chose the, uh, the Guggenheim Bilbao exactly to illustrate that you can actually do this. You can do what we talk about, and there are people doing it, and it's still not only beautiful, but exquisitely beautiful. One more war story, then I'll ask you to wrap it up, because I can't go with this podcast without talking about Jimi Hendrix Electric Lady Studios. And I'll be straight up with you. I'm a huge Jimi Hendrix music fan. I was not aware of the backstory behind Electric Lady Studios, which, based upon the number of artists who have recorded there, from Led Zeppelin to Stevie Wonder to Jay-Z, may be one of the great music recording studios of all time, but started with a vision from maybe the greatest guitarist of all time. Um, just tell us briefly about that story, why that's an example of how you get big things done. Yes, yeah, Spencer, I'm also a big Hendrix fan. So because I am, I've read a lot of biographies about Jimi Hendrix. And this story about his studio came popping up in all the books, you know, that at one stage he sort of fell in love with this nightclub and he asked whether he could uh, rent it or lease it. And then he wanted to develop it into actually a nightclub at first. But then his producer, Eddie Kramer, very famous producer who also produced the Beatles, he told him, Jimmy, I mean, don't do a nightclub because I know you want to jam with your friends and so on, but do a really cozy studio instead because then we can actually record what you're doing and use it. And you're going to be saving enormous amounts of money in studio fees because Jimmy Hendrix spent a lot of time in studios and they paid for that at that time. So... Jimmy said, hey, that's a great idea. And they started building the studio. And he actually hired somebody who was like 21, 22 years old, a, a graduate straight out of Princeton University's uh, architecture school. Uh, and uh, it didn't go well, to say the least. He'd never tried to design a studio before. And he actually said that. You don't want me for this, uh, Jimmy. I've never designed a studio. Uh, and I've never even been in the studio, he said. And Jimmy said, no, that's okay. You just go ahead and do it. And they had huge cost overruns, huge delays. Jimmy needed to go on tour to make more money. They were flying the money in bags, and then they could start the work again after it had been stopped. And uh, eventually that wasn't enough, and Jimmy had to go to his record uh, company and say, can you help me, and can you invest in this so we can get it finished? And the record company invested. And they finally got it finished, and it actually is... It's still uh, operating today. It's the oldest uh, recording studio in New York, uh, and it's famous for its excellent acoustics. So it turned out really well, even though they had all these problems. And that's an argument that is being used in project management. Just start, you know, just start digging a hole, whatever it is, and your creativity will help you. And, and in the end, you will be successful. So we test that thesis in the book. And we actually document that Jimmy just got lucky. The vast majority of projects don't turn out like that. 80% of projects, if you do it like that, they, they end up as failures. Well, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, but I guess most of the time it's not. So, Bent, final question. Biggest piece of advice you'd give to a developer, occupier, uh, while they're planning a project? I would give the same piece of advice that Warren Buffett gives to people in the finance sector. And it's not that different. It's what's your downside? A lot of people get too focused on the opportunities. And, and by all means, I'm not speaking against opportunities. That would be idiotic. Opportunities are important. They are what get, get us up in the morning and, and why we do things. But if you forget the downside, you're really setting yourself up for failure. And also remember, there's not a symmetry uh, between downside and upside. There's an asymmetry because the downside can actually kill you, can put you out of business. And there's no upside that can compensate for that. So therefore, the downside is where you need to put your focus, in addition to keep an eye on the upside, of course. So what's your downside? That If I can only give one piece of advice, that's it. So on behalf of The Weekly Take, I want to thank again, Professor Bent Flupia from Oxford University and Copenhagen's IT University, not only for uh, sharing his ideas on how big things get done, his 10th book, uh, but also how these ideas apply to the real estate industry. Professor, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. For more, please visit our website, cbre.com slash The Weekly Take. You can share the show and Professor Flubier's big ideas. You can find related content and also subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen. And don't forget, on our webpage, 
You can also use the new Talk to Us feature, a streamlined way to share feedback, questions, or requests, which we might follow up on in a future episode. We'll be off next week after the Memorial Day holiday, but we'll return with an episode we're really excited about. Enjoy your long weekend. I'm Spencer Levy. Be smart, be safe, be well.